Great to see everyone this morning. Hope you're all having a great time at LibertyCon. I know I am. Um, I'm so excited to moderate uh, this debate between Spike Cohen, VP of the uh, Libertarian Ticket uh, last time round, and Stephen, aka Destiny, a streamer on YouTube and various platforms. So the topic is libertarianism, perfect solution, or unrealistic fantasy. Um, probably most of us in the room thinks that, well, maybe it's not a perfect solution, a solution of yeah, some kind. Say, yeah. uh, I think one of the most uh, valuable things libertarians can do, or people who want to spread libertarian ideas, is have conversations, friendly conversations, with people who are interested in our ideas and, and want to engage with them in good faith. You know, if we just only talk to ourselves, et cetera, it's fun, but at some point, what, like, what good is it uh, accomplishing? So very excited uh, to have this debate. Um, Stephen, I want to start with you and just to ask you to spend a few minutes um, engaging with the topic. Um, what are the, the issues that you have with libertarianism? Where, where do you think the, the limits are and, and where, what are the policy issues where it, it's, not, it's not getting the job done? Yeah, so I think the first question you always have to ask, and this is probably true even among libertarians, is when you say libertarianism, what exactly do you mean? Because I've heard everything from, it's almost like socialism, where some people will say it's everything from abolishing all private property all the way to like, well, it's just a heavily subsidized like welfare state or something. Um, and then for libertarians, I've heard like answers as extreme as like, like anarcho-capitalism. There's absolutely no like formal arrangement of like any like third party arbitrators or whatever that aren't just like private individuals agreeing to things, all the way to like, I've heard some people, like a, a Ron Paul-esque person, might say, like, well, abolish the Fed and like, have the government kind of back away from things. Um, my kind of general problems with libertarianism, in like, the most broadest sense, um, I think the three topics that I try to like, kind of dance around, um, one is welfare, the idea that there are going to be some people in society that are just, are we allowed to cuss up here? I have no idea. Uh, some people in society are heavily disadvantaged, I'll say. Um, or say fracked, maybe. Sure, so they're fracked. <laughs> some people Balance in society are heavily disadvantaged, and there's not much incentive for other people to help them, say for hopefully family members if you can. Um, so welfare is a big one. War, I think that foreign um, affairs are a very important part of like how the world functions and operates, and the only way to deal on that international level is to have a collective group of people that are being represented by a government that can raise and recruit an army, that can intersect with other countries and represent on behalf of all the people. Um, <clears throat> And then the third thing would be um, stuff related to like intellectual property or like patents. So for instance, like how do pharmaceutical companies protect their intellectual property in a libertarian society where there's not like a third party that's protecting uh, like property rights or like patents or trademarks? Hmm. That's very interesting. Actually, I, I think if I were to make the argument I, I thought you were going to make and identify areas of libertarianism where I think they're good, um, more compelling in my view, arguments against them. I'm not actually sure I would have picked any of those. <laughs> That's cool. very, very okay. interesting. Wow. Um, Spike, how would you respond uh, you know, to this idea? And, and then maybe we'll get into the specifics of the ones he raised because they're very interesting. Sure. So um, first of all, I want to uh, give a couple caveats. Uh, I actually hurt my back. So if you see me suddenly wince, uh, it's not necessarily because of something that Stephen or Robbie said, necessarily. <laughs> uh, and also, uh, I'm on just enough painkillers to be able to get through this. So if you like Spike Cohen, you're going to love Spike Cohen on drugs. Um, so uh, that will likely be the biggest applause line any of us get. Um, so uh, going to what uh, Stephen said, and first of all, I agree that is part of the problem when we talk about these things. If we're talking libertarianism, are we talking anarcho-capitalism? Are we talking a night watchman state? So I think rather than get into a, a, a debate inside of a debate, uh, I think it's better to just talk broadly about the idea behind libertarianism and we can apply it to what we're talking about. Uh, so the three things you brought up were war, uh, I guess um, intellectual uh, property, and, and uh, welfare, right? Yeah, the three okay. W's. I'll say war, welfare, research. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm so sorry. That's the only time I'll do that. No, that's good. Um, so we'll start with uh, we'll start with the I guess the first one you did was welfare. Um, I think first of all, and we probably agree on this. Maybe we don't. Um, that the first thing that any society should be doing when we're looking at how to help the poor is to stop uh, creating weaponized systems that have the explicit intent of making and keeping them poor. 
So if you look at, for example, if you look at the uh, ridiculous uh, level of occupational licensing that we have, if you look at practices like over-criminalization, using the war on drugs, the war on guns, and all the other wars on victimless crimes, if you look at things like cash bail, if you look at things like the, uh, the school-to-prison pipeline, those are things that we probably agree on uh, that you know, we could be doing to eliminate the amount of poverty that's in, in a way being created. Uh, when it comes to welfare, the thing that I would say is that if we have a, uh, if we have eliminated that much welfare, if we, if we look at welfare as sort of like a safety net, and if we start putting the rungs back on the ladder, getting rid of the excessive taxation, regulation, and overcriminalization that leads to so much poverty, a lot of people that are currently stuck in a safety net are going to be able to climb out of it. If we also don't have a Federal Reserve that, in order to pay for the welfare state, the warfare state, and everything else, is, uh, is no, if we don't have a Federal Reserve and a, a, a uh, monopoly on currency generation that is uh, driving up the price of living because of monetary inflation, then many people won't be in any effective poverty. They may have the same amount of money, but that money will go further. And for those who still need help, you can use things like mutual aid and charity to get them out of, out of you know, the situation they're in and help them be able to, to get back on their feet. But the problem we have right now is that poverty has been, in many cases, made permanent and, and in a way, uh, sort of made into a generational problem instead of a temporary problem. And yeah, that would be hard to deal with just with charity or mutual aid. But simply getting the government off a lot of these people's backs would do a incredible amount of good. Um, when it comes to war, we live in the country whose government is carrying out most of the war that's happening in the world. Um, if you look at the, I call it a genocide that's happening in Yemen, where the, the U.S. government is sun funding uh, the Saudi government and elements of Al Qaeda who are carrying out something that looks even more brutal than what Russia is carrying out in Ukraine and has been going on for far longer. Um, I think that the idea of having uh, a, a long-term standing military, the problem is when government creates a program, they have to create a reason to expand it and a reason to continue it. And that's what we've seen with the war on terrorism, with the, the, the uh, militarization of the war on drugs. That has been a continuation of a program, the Pentagon, that has to have a reason to continue itself. Um, and so I would say that actually it's better to have a defensive force. And even if that is uh, either a smaller military or, a, uh, or you know, some kind of a militia system or something like that, that's not what we have. We, we have a war machine, and it's costing lives here and, and abroad. It's costing us a fortune. It's certainly not making us any uh, less safe. When it comes to in intellectual uh, property, um, I will admit that's the, probably the thing I know the least about of the things that we're talking about. Um, well, and, and it's, uh, it's a thing that um, there's actually a, somewhat a range of libertarian views on. I, yeah, I was going to say, There yeah. are some issues, you know, that are still up for, obviously all issues are up for discussion and debate, but I, I know, uh, you know, very principled libertarian people who can take um, different, um, you know, different uh, sides on that issue. There are pro and anti-IP yeah. libertarians, yeah. yeah. By, by the way, if your back is still hurting later, I have some heroin in my okay. room. So just, just I've kidding. Using, if this is streaming, I I've, don't want the yes. Legalize heroin. Woohoo! Legalize heroin. Not, DA, not don't come use to my heroin, room, but you should. Um, but, if yeah. uh, this is streaming, um, so Stephen, uh, what, what I think I think you raised a good point when you said like, what kind of libertarianism are we talking about? That is such a broad term. So I get annoyed when socialists say, do exactly what you just said. Say. Well, yeah, I'm a socialist. I'm like, well, you mean that a revolutionary vanguard should seize the means of production from? Yep. It's not a system yep. that works very well. And then they say, no, I just you know, want more welfare. So I'm like, okay, it's not socialism. Um, how do you feel about, um, I, I would say I'm directionally libertarian. I want to move the existing things we have in, in more of the direction that Spike was articulating that, okay, well, how can we make, how can we, if we have a welfare system, how can we subject it to some kind of market forces that will make it more efficient? If we, if we have to have a military, how can we be, have it be more accountable to the, what the people actually want, which is not, oftentimes not what this you know, war machine wants. Um, if, we ha if we have to have some kind of intellectual property, how can we have it so that innovation is still permitted and you, you're not just giving massive benefits to Pfizer and it's, so on and so forth? Um, I, I, how, do you, how do you feel about directional libertarianism? I love the concept of directional libertarianism as it can happen under a liberal 
style of economy and government. One of the biggest strengths, I think, of liberalism is it allows for a whole bunch of different economic and political philosophies to exist within it and then to kind of function as they will within that system. So if you want to have a small town where you vote, um, I mean, we've got, how many, we've got sanctuary cities that say we're not, gonna, we're not gonna cooperate with the federal government when it comes to turning in illegal immigrants. We've got states now that have legalized drugs that are still federally illegal. Um, you've got people that will run and form co-ops in a capitalist society where generally you'd expect to see external capital and you'd expect to see shareholders and stuff. You've got workers that own the means of production, quite literally. I think that um, the advocation of certain libertarian ideas in terms of moving some things in a different direction. Uh, so like getting rid of the war on drugs. I, I don't think, I don't know who even supports that anymore. Well, probably older people. <laughs> there are a lot of people <laughs> that still unfortunately. That maintain, yeah, well, a lot of boomers. But um, yeah, things <laughs> like getting rid of the war on drugs, I think, is an overwhelmingly positive idea. Um, things like analyzing, like, well, what is the application of military force that's appropriate across the world? You know, do we really want to be selling arms or be in bed with the Saudis when they are supporting genocidal regimes in Yemen? Um, these are really good questions. And I love that under a liberal style of government, we're able to kind of like have all of those conversations. Um, whereas in a more hardcore libertarian style of government, if we wanted to have the conversation of there's a potentially important conflict brewing in um, Eastern Europe, what can we do? And everybody's like, well, I don't know. We don't have a military. We can't do anything. And it's like, oh, OK, well, our options are far more limited under other styles of regimes, like, say, communism, socialism, or libertarianism, that I think libertarian or that liberalism gives us the uh, flexibility to address. What do you think about that? Well, uh, first of all, uh, we're talking about having uh, differ, uh, um, definitional issues. When you say liberalism, there are many people in here who actually consider themselves liberals, classical liberals. So when you're saying a liberal system, would you mind just yeah, I guess when I, when I say liberal system, so I'm talking about some form of like representative democracy combined with some form of like capitalist economy where the things that we value are like property rights, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, things that are like enshrined in our like Bill of Rights essentially. Right. I like kind of very broad sense of like what it means to be a liberal. Okay, so I mean it almost sounds like a federalist system you're talking about where a lot of the decisions are being made more locally than having a, a centrally planned from the absolute top, but where like you said, different decisions are being made at a more local level for that community to kind of fit them. Am I, I just want to make sure I'm not missing Yeah, in a bit. I mean, I think the idea behind the United States is always that like a decision ought to be made as locally as possible. I, I tend to agree with that. Uh, kind of taking a step back on first principles, I think any form of governance, and this might also answer the minarchy versus anarchy question on, on how we're defining libertarian. A debate we are going to have A debate later. we'll be having at 3.30 if you, if you want to do You're that. You're going to be out of the chair. And somebody so else that, but that we'll that. avoid doing that with this time. Um, I would say that uh, in general, libertarianism, if you were applying it to how a system of governance would work, you would say that that system of governance would want to be as local as feasible as possible. The decisions being made would be made by the actual stakeholders in a given situation as much as possible. The mechanism of funding for that system would be as voluntary as possible, and the ability to opt out uh, would be as much as, as feasible and as possible. Um, that could fit within a, uh, a so-called night watchman, minarchist type of, of federal estate. Uh, and it's likely that you know if we use the idea that central planning, uh, that the more centralized decision making is, uh, the worse overall it's going to be and the worse the outcomes are going to be for the vast majority of people, then that would lend itself to that within any of those systems. Some kind of democratic way of making those decisions uh, would be the best way possible. So, so well, yeah, I'm, just, I'm kind of curious then. So on my three prongs, focusing on the war side, yeah. let's say that Mexico tomorrow decides that they want to invade the libertarian states of America. What yeah. do you do? Well, I, first of all, if you have a well-armed populace, the, that's probably going to be not very feasible. I mean, one, one of the things that we've seen, there's not, there isn't a standing army uh, that would be able to invade, um, forget a, a nation of 330, well, uh, 330 million well-armed people, even a state of a few million well-armed people, that's not a real thing. That's not feasible. They could maybe have an invasion and they could blow up buildings, but in terms of actually whatever goals they would have in a long-term invasion, being able to occupy, being able to take over resources, that can't happen with a, with a well-armed uh, well populace. Now, it's not to say that you couldn't then have some kind of either a, a regular training system like a, a, a militia or something similar that could be called up. And the beauty of having it that way instead of a standing army with military bases and weapons 
weapons programs and everything else, is the impulse to use this thing that you have to justify the ever-growing budget that you need to have wouldn't be there. You'd have something that would be ready and on call, but couldn't be used for you know, uh, right. widespread world policeman type style. Well, so let's, also, I well, think in quick. addition to what you're saying, that you're more likely to get invaded by Mexico if you have the kind of vast police and national intelligence well, there's, and there's agency the forces well. that the but government has. So I've heard this argument before, but let's lean a little bit more into this. So I think you can invade a well-armed population very easily. You would just be killing them all, right? Like, holding territory and having the citizens being like subservient to you while they're all well-armed and hate you is probably much more difficult. But if we were talking about like an invasion into like New Mexico or Texas, which is mostly empty land, save for like a couple of big cities, it'd be pretty easy for another country to make big territorial gains. The only people that could resist a formal army would be like individually trained citizens. I, I just don't see the ability for well, like, but we've, like, the, like individual citizens in like a state. Like, are people from Austin going to drive over to like El Paso to like defend that city? Right. So from? again, it's not necessarily that you wouldn't have some kind of ability to have a a uh, a force to call up when and if needed. Uh, and if they decided they wanted to have some minimal presence to be able to make sure if something happened, there was something there. Uh, also, if, if, we're, if we're going to the hypothetical of the Mexican army deciding that it wants to wage a campaign of genocide, of actually going in and killing everyone, it's likely that there would be some indicators beforehand. Like, this isn't going to happen tomorrow, right? Sure. So if that were the case, then there would be able to be that, okay, well, this looks like this is something that's going to be happening. We can be, begin calling up the people that we've had regularly training for this type of thing. But that's to go from that step to say that a, another government could do something, uh, could, could decide they want to commit genocide and invade, and therefore we should have... I want to make sure we're on in agreement that we should not have the military industrial complex we have now. Is that I correct? love the military industrial complex. Okay, so and you're saying that unironically. Yes. Okay, all right. So, so like, because what I'm going to to avoid, because I'm sure you've probably been on this dialogue a million times, but the questions I'm going to start to ask are going to be like, so you think that we should have a group of people that we could call up when needed, they're getting some type of regular training, yep. we're probably making some sort of investment into like arming them, we're probably having some kind of logistic. At some point, are we kind of just rebuilding the military? No, because it's, the idea is that it remains as a defensive force. If you have something that's there that exists, it turns into what we have now, and I, I want to make clear what we have right now. What we have right now costs us uh, over a trillion dollars a year. Uh, it has cost us, just in my time, it has cost tens of thousands of American lives in combat. It has cost countless, but millions of uh, innocent lives overseas. It has cost hundreds of thousands more veterans who have come back with uh, uh, traumatic brain injuries and all sorts of other chronic health problems and, and mental health problems uh, who, uh, for a variety of reasons, end up either dying early or taking their own lives. It has cost trillions of dollars, uh, actually tens of trillions of dollars. It has cost uh, the... Uh, almost immeasurable amount of inflation we have had because much of that has been funded through Federal Reserve printing of notes uh, to lend to the Treasury Department, which devalues your currency and causes the cost of your living to go up. And the biggest thing that they can show that they have done with this military industrial complex in the last 20 years was to replace the Taliban with a better armed Taliban that we paid for the armaments for. So the idea of a military, I mean, that's certainly well, a and, and Also, wait, hold on, wait. So there are great costs to the First Amendment. Would you agree to that? I Freedom believe of that there are, but I don't believe that a, sure. a invasive... Uh, That's fine, but I'm saying there are... The the First Amendment comes with it, the ability to do an almost unmeasurable amount of harm to society with the type of speech that you proliferate in society, which is okay, because we've decided that even though there might be some great costs associated with allowing anybody a platform to speak, in the United States, we feel so strongly about that right that we're willing to accept the trade-offs for the benefit of having but, that right. But so who is the we, we in the military-industrial complex? The example. we is the existence of the United States is essentially like the leader of the free world. But even from it's the, the ability liberal... to ensure the, the, our trade routes, it's the ability to maintain leadership across conflicts across the world. Um, it might be the ability to help a country like Ukraine resist what was thought to be the second most powerful army in the entire world. Um, and that's something that we wouldn't be able to do if we didn't have the military investment that we did. But even under your regime of sort of liberal democracy, I mean, these, decision, these are decisions not being made. They're not subject to democratic forces at this point. They're not accountable because there's no... Wait, what's not subject there's to democratic no congressional, forces? There's no the, congressional... These wars are not being congressionally authorized anymore. 
The, um, the Ukraine funding is all stuff we're voting on. Like the, we voted on the like, Libya replacement, the 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 Syria involvement, the drone deaths of sure. Various we, we, yeah, we don't directly vote on every single thing, but we have representatives. If we really don't like things, and that starts to dictate like who we vote for, that's kind so of, like, I you know I feel like I'm doing the meme where where we're saying you know how did my freedoms get over in Afghanistan and Iraq? How is what the military industrial complex has done largely in the Middle East and and the global South? How is that something that has protected my right to freedom of speech or, or my rights, especially considering that coupled with that military industrial complex is the internal surveillance state complex, uh, which you know, we have found out means the government keeping track of basically every single thing we do, uh, every single electronic communication we make. How is that protecting or preserving anyone's any, any right? Yeah, th so there's not gonna be, I can't defend every single aspect of how the United States military or government conducts itself. Like I said, I think rightfully there are a lot of criticisms that one could make of how the government and the military industrial complex conducts itself. But when I look at things like, for instance, the conflict occurring in Ukraine, only the United States could have been the leader needed in that situation to give Ukraine the tools they needed and to get other countries on board with being able to resist Russia in the way that they have. But, That's something that only the United States could have done. But, but someone there's who been say no, that like, has military brought us precipitously closer to nuclear war. Do what? <laughs> Some people would say that that uh, the contributions we've made have brought the entire planet. Most people would be wrong, right? What's brought well, us yeah. closer to nuclear war is Russia being an aggressive invader. Of well, a any, yeah, even putting that argument aside, it's not as though the, the military-industrial complex, like the, the U.S. military, is not. Uh, invaded or, or, or I shouldn't say invaded, has not intervened there, has not, there's been no bombing. No, but weapons that, that we've developed, systems that we've invested in, weapons that we've sold to other countries, other countries that we've gotten on board with our military training, other countries that we've coordinated with because of the size of our military. If the United States is a libertarian country, why would Germany, France, Poland, the UK listen to us when it comes to leading in conflicts in Eastern Europe? Why would they not listen to us if we were demonstrating that we were leading the world in peace instead of war? Because you can't lead the world if, if you're a completely isolated country with no ability to project okay, power so, anywhere so else yeah, in the world so either. So there is a difference between isolationism and non-interventionism. So the idea, if we distill it down, the, the, the idea that there's either we have to be the main warmongers in the world or be isolated, distilled down as saying you either have to punch everyone in the face that you walk up to or never talk to anyone. I, I, I reject that no, argument. I was talking about punching everybody in the face. Face, but, but, again, that's like how but that's that's essentially, U.S. foreign policy is essentially, you're either on our side or we're punching you in the face, or actually killing lots of you. There, are, that, non that's, there that's are lots of non-aligned states around the world that the United States, believe it or not, doesn't have an interest in. Now, we have a lot of allies that do things as well. Like, it's not like the United States has um, drones in Yemen because we just hate Yemen people, right? It's because of our relationship with Saudi Arabia, which I admit does get more complicated, and I think there's room for criticism there. But again, to focus <laughs> on, like, the, probably the most important conflict right now militarily happening over the last 10 years would be what's going on Ukraine, and only the United States would have been in a position to take point on that, because Russia isn't playing by a libertarian rule book. They're playing by like a totalitarian, authoritarian rule but, book. But, but that's, let's, not, let's that's a, not correct, though, because the, the most of what is happening in, uh, in Europe is actually European states that are, that are getting involved, including, obviously, Ukraine. European I mean, states at the behest of who, though? Who was the one that brought all of these states to the table? The what alliance was? Wait, so, so are you saying, so if Ukraine says, we're being invaded by Russia, you would be next because you're right behind us, please help. It requires a country on the other side of the planet saying, yes, I think you should help them to, to make that happen. I, I don't. But let's, let's why, I mean, a, the United States is the de facto head of NATO, of course, yeah. Let's <laughs> take a step back, though. Are we, I don't think Spike is saying, and I, are, are you saying that you, you wouldn't be, you're not a libertarian nation or a libertarian organization if you have a standing military? I'm not sure I would say that. I, I'm saying that. Have when, a, maybe we're arguing for libertarianism, not yeah, anarchy. Well, for some I mean, people would argue for anarchy, but. The military is an important part of it. It's, it's, it's a game, it's a game. Fundament, that's one of the, the fundamental things, right, that libertarians, some, many libertarians would say is something government can do. Yeah, it's, well, but they would say only defense, and that any type of, like, foreign intervention would be, by definition, like, not defensive. Well, it's uh, not. Yeah, exactly. So, I, but I All think right. that that... So we are, ha we are having that argument. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, the issue is that, like, when, when you have other countries, it's kind of like a game theory-esque thing. Sometimes when I ask socialists or communists, I say, how are you going to make your country competitive with other economies around the world if you guys are investing so much more into things like workers or whatever, and you're not investing into, like, better products, right? Because you want to protect worker rights, which is admirable. But their answer is always, well we would need a global socialist revolution. And it's like, okay, so insofar as you have a, because then you ask them, well, why haven't any communist or socialist countries succeeded? And they go, well, it's because of all the evil countries around them that are ruining them. It's like, okay. So it seems like you have to have some level of um, self-sufficiency, some level of self-assuredness, some form of economy and some style of government that allows you to resist external pressure. And I haven't seen a libertarian style of government that's capable of doing that. And then when I look at how other countries around the world function, like say Russia, um, I don't think Ukraine would want the United States 
or Germany or France or Poland or the UK to be healthy, independent, libertarian countries. They probably want them to be very liberal government, uh, countries with strong governments that have militaries that are being funded and supported by the people that can send arms and help over to Ukraine to help them resist Russia. Well, I think right now the Ukraine probably wishes that there hadn't been a strong interventionist US who convinced them to give up their nuclear weapons in exchange for a promise of peace. Uh, because right now, uh, if, if, uh, if you'll recall, uh, with the breakup of the Soviet Union at one point, uh, the Ukraine had the third largest, second or third largest stockpile of nuclear weapons. Uh, and the uh, US and Russia, in their uh, nuclear non-proliferation strategy, which means only we get to have nukes, um, it, they went to Ukraine and offered security assurances, which you can see what those were worth, um, in exchange for uh, the promise of, uh, in exchange for them giving up their nukes to Russia, which is interesting. So basically well, what, they, what they were saying is, uh, if you uh, give up your nukes, then the two countries who are the most likely to uh, invade you at some point or intervene at some point, uh, we totally promise that we won't do that. And within a span of, of one generation, that, that obviously has been broken. Because th this started at least in 2014 with the, uh, the invasion and annexing of, of, of Crimea. So this was a thing. It was in 1994. It was called the Budapest Memorandum. And yeah. it is true that Russia and the United States um, had Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and one other nation where they said, we're going to move all of your nuclear weapons out in exchange for some promise of territorial sovereignty. Yeah. But the issue is that Ukraine didn't want to manage those nuclear weapons. It was like over 1,600 active nuclear weapons in one of the most, what would become one of the most corrupt states in the entire world. Um, I think that it was probably a score for every single person that the nuclear weapons that were in Ukraine were moved out of Ukraine. As much as I don't like Russia, I probably want that active nuclear arsenal being managed by Russia rather than in Ukraine that was a corrupt, incredibly messed up state with, that couldn't even afford the proper maintenance of those weapons. I think that the Ukrainians would disagree with you at the moment. But putting that they aside. They might disagree at the moment, but they voted for the Budapest memorandum as much as anybody else did. It's not like we forced it on them. They agreed to that treaty. They couldn't manage that nuclear arsenal. Yes, this is an argument against this kind of style of, of foreign policy. That's, that's Do you think right. it's business better for more countries to have nuclear weapons? Should every country have a nuclear weapon? I don't know necessarily that every country should have nuclear weapons, but I think it's, uh, it's quite a uh, coincidence that the only countries that have even been remotely subject to invasion from the US or from Russia or any other, any other of these uh, uh, aggressive states um, have been countries that haven't had nuclear arms. Um, so it, and there, the only country that was, you had nuclear weapons used on them was used by us. <laughs> yes, yeah, and, and, and another side note here, the only time uh, in the entire history of nuclear weapons that they have been used was when only one party had them, and that was when the, the dropping of Fat Man and Little Boy on, on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I'm not sure if I did those correctly, but, uh, and then with just one other state uh, having nuclear weapons. As soon as Russia got them, and certainly Russia was not a, a good actor, but one other state having it was enough for that to be off the table as just being the new way of doing, you know, replacing carpet bombing with nuke bombing, which obviously has been a good thing. So I would say that the uh, nuclear non-proliferation strategy taken to its uh, logical step is about effective, as effective as a no-gun zone in a school, right? You're, you're saying that only the bad actor is going to have this. Putting that aside, I don't think that necessarily the Ukrainian government would have decided, yes, we're going to keep this entire stockpile of weapons. But by having this US world policeman style of foreign policy, they said, oh, listen, we're the world police. We'll take care of you. All you have to do is give up your nukes. Well, that failed. And the reason it failed is because, frankly, if the people that were at looking at this Budapest man, uh, memorandum at the uh, first place would have realized the United States government, as, there, as uh, everyone from Joe Biden and everyone uh, in the government has said, even AOC has said this, is that the United States government is not going to intervene in a hot war with the other largest nuclear power on the planet. So in retrospect, uh, I, I would say that the libertarian idea that defense should be as local as possible, if applied to this situation, would mean that a nuclear-armed Ukraine would not fear Russian aggression, or at least not Russian military aggression, and that any kind of things that Russia uh, would do would have to remain on a political diplomatic or economic or social front and could not lead to a hot war because Russia knows what would happen if they actually did that. That's an interesting argument in favor of massive nuclear proliferation. I tend to be against it. Um, I, I guess that's one route you can go. I feel like the simpler route would probably be that you should just be allies with a country that has nukes. I think that the way that NATO is structured, and I think Ukraine being in NATO, is probably a better solution than every single country around Russia trying to get nuclear weapons. But it, but but it I, didn't I, work. 
No, it didn't so, work because so, Ukraine's so, not in NATO. If we, if we it have, did work. If you, if you go up and you ask the Baltics, it worked for them. They're not being invaded by Russia, right? I, if Russia had decided to invade Ukraine as a NATO country, we would be watching uh, American politicians explaining why, even though you, uh, uh, Ukraine is a NATO country, we're not going to start. Russia would never problem. invade a NATO country, though. That's the whole point. You said it yourself. Having nuclear weapons or that nuclear shield, it's one of the reasons why from 91 to 2014, Europe was an incredibly peaceful place. And even from 2014 to 2022, aside from the um, Ukrainian conflict, Europe has been far more stable than it was in the preceding 100 years. So you're arguing for nuclear proliferation, but just under the aegis of the, the U.S. military. I'm arguing for a nuclear shield where those nukes are managed by as few countries as possible. So that's nuclear proliferation with extra steps. If you think that nuclear proliferation with extra steps is the same thing as being in NATO and having the defense of the United States versus every independent, non-aligned country having nuclear weapons, I don't know what to say. Well, I would say that if you are relying on the, uh, the US military industrial complex to not act like the scorpion and eventually stab, uh, sting you as well, then I'm not sure what to say to you. I mean, well, what do you the mean? US Wait, what does that mean? Sting the, who? the U.S. government has invaded, bombed, and destabilized more countries than any other country combined, uh, certainly even within our lifetimes, but in the last century. And uh, pretty much since World War II, it has been the U.S. government that has been the main purveyor of mass violence around the globe. I, so I mean, the, in contrast, and, and so we're in this situation, man, where we here are here in this sort of cone of safety of we won't get invaded by the U.S. because we are the U.S. And we talk about all the beautiful things that come from this military industrial complex. And it's almost like Hunger Games. We're like the comfortably sitting people who get to talk about the, you know, we can sit here and say things like, well, there are certainly some criticisms to be made, while hundreds of thousands of people are being mass murdered by a, a conglomeration of dictatorships and terrorist groups that are being sponsored by our military. So to argue that they should be the ones making, to argue that they should be making both the moral and physical case for world peace is to ignore the entire history of what the U.S. military actually does. It is an argument against not just the U.S., because this is not U.S. bashing, okay? Because if Russia was in the same position we had, I can guarantee you Vladimir Putin would be the same or worse. And this China, is an argument, and China. and China, of course, China, China very bad, <laughs> uh, but this is an argument against this sort of central hegemony of any state or of any government, and to decentralize that ability to defend oneself as locally as possible, whether it's at the state level, and when I say state, I mean like government, at the national level, to if you have it that way, then you could still have you know, bilateral and multilateral agreements and all of that stuff. But if you try to create this, this umbrella of this one main superpower is going to ensure everyone's peace, but also we have to pretend that they aren't mass murdering people on a regular basis and arming the terrorist groups that they use as the pretext for the justification of their growth and expansion to begin with, that's just foolishness. There's no reason to do it that way. Mm. We, we should so in your, wait, wait, I, go ahead. I, I, I sure, got it, sure. this is sure. the line of reasoning. So first of all, I think it's important to sell, separate foreign policy from before and after the fall of the Soviet Union. Foreign policy from World War II to 91 was far different than US foreign policy from 91 to 2022. That's true. Um, however, the second question then, so are you opposed to the existence, say, of NATO? I am opposed to the existence of NATO in its current form. Okay, I, so then against, the next question not, would be, the next question would be, if you look at countries like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, um, Poland, Hungary, do you think that all of these countries, the world would be a better place if all of them felt like they needed nuclear weapons to resist Russian aggression? They do need nuclear weapons. They're just relying on uh, a foreign super state to okay. provide them. So that's, this is where we fundamentally disagree. The idea that you're advocating for, that we have a, a world where over 100 countries are racing to acquire nuclear weapons, that is a world that is far closer towards some sort of nuclear conflict than one where the United States is providing defense and security for countries that are part of the alliance. I don't, I don't see how that there would be requires, any other take on that. That requires saying that a, uh, someone in Latvia is inherently less trustworthy than a, a public or military official in the U.S. to use nuclear weapons, despite the evidence of the fact that the U.S. military is literally the only one that's actually ever used them. So to compare the use of nuclear weapons during World War II for the first time ever, which was, what, 80 years ago? And to try to say that, like, well, we could nuke anybody at any time is an incredibly reductive view of how nuclear weapons function in the world, number one. Um, number two, the United States is more trustworthy to handle nuclear weapons in a responsible way because of that hated military-industrial complex. We have the technology, we have the people, we've got the department 
Department of Energy. We've got people that are trained. We've got the installations to handle, to facilitate the use of these nuclear weapons in a way, and we have a pretty large democracy that is, believe it or not, relatively free of corruption compared to other states in the world. I think that I would trust the United States to handle those weapons better than 50 different independent countries all bordering other states that they feel like could invade them at any point in time. We're, uh, we're rapidly running out of time here, so we should probably touch on... Oh, we have six minutes left. <laughs> on uh, one of the other uh, subjects. You, I, I find the, the intellectual property thing you raised very interesting, but I'm, I'm not sure it... Uh, it um, because different libertarians actually disagree, as yeah, I said there are earlier, two different, on whether... Uh, heavy yeah, they, whether the, the IP penalties. question is very simple. So say you have a product that you've got to invest um, $100 billion, or we'll say $1 billion to bring a product to market, but once you've done the research and development, it only costs a dollar to make each individual little widget that you sell. How do you get a company to invest that initial $1 billion if once they've done it and everybody sees how you can make the $1 widget, everybody else starts manufacturing the widget? So I'm going to answer this very, very broadly because, as I said, I, I will admit that this is one of my, my weaker subjects. I will say that my understanding is that the patent system that we have as it exists largely didn't exist in any real way for the, uh, until about, say, two or 300 years ago. And the, the now international treaty-protected system of patents that we have now is largely a post-World War II phenomenon or certainly a post-World War I phenomenon. Uh, the idea is that, uh, what I would say is that and again, this is very broadly speaking, clearly a lot of advancement of human society, which involved the investment of proportionally large amounts of, of capital and resources, was happening prior to that being in place. Um, I'm not going to try to make a, an anti-IP argument for two reasons. Number one, like I said, it's not a strong subject that I can get into the weeds on. And number two, there are both libertarian arguments that are exactly your argument for IP and uh, libertarian arguments that say that IP uh, does not exist. From a philosophical standpoint, I say if something isn't scarce, it's not property. Uh, so an idea, therefore, it can't be property and taken to its logical conclusion. If I say something and you repeat it and I sue you because you've taken my IP, that's, that's, that's the logical conclusion of that idea. But from a, a, a brass tax standpoint, I would just defer to the fact that up until about two or 300 years ago, we didn't have such a thing and we still saw you know, tremendous amounts of, of advancement, including the capital and, and resources that were invested. But I will defer on the fact that I, I can't. Yeah, I think it's a really you know. interesting subject. I, I used to be much more favor, I think, of in, in favor of militant IP protections. Uh, and then I, I was per, more persuaded by some of libertarian arguments uh, against uh, them and, and the fact that it seems to me like things are, um, uh, patents have gotten very abusive and there's much filing of things right. that ought yeah. to not be covered. Um, I, I take your point about how, you know, how, do you, how would you induce um, research to actually be done. It seems like it needs to be, but it could be more limited through a kind of common law sort of thing. Well, this is what is captured under, under this category, and this is what's not. I mean, insulin, everyone's very upset about the price of insulin these days. A lot of people are upset about insulin because I don't know anything about insulin. It's one of the subjects that triggers me the most. Okay, go ahead. A lot of people will talk about insulin, and they'll say insulin is a drug that should only cost $5. Yeah. We could make this, you know, 100 years ago. We made it from pigs. It's so simple, and it's so easy. Anybody, are there any diabetics in here? Can't see anybody. Nobody. I was gonna say I couldn't see if they were, but yeah. You know. No diabetics at a libertarian conference. That's interesting. Again, no, 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 I'm just kidding. Up in the no, room. no, no. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But um, uh, no, I mean like the insulin that you took before is like your blood sugar is high. You inject your thing and you you crash hard. You feel like shit. You got to time your stuff. You got to poke your finger every. You got to figure out like at all times what your blood sugar is. The um, the different formations that we have on insulin formulas that exist today are far more complicated. Are far more nuanced. There's a reason why there's so much R and D that goes into it. It regulates your blood sugar throughout the day. And a far more even way. You can do it with one injection. There's like time release. It's, it's a very, very, very sophisticated formula that's used today. A lot of people point to insulin as like the number one reason why pharmacies are so horrible and evil and destructive, or pharmaceuticals are. And I would point to insulin. I'd say, well, actually, I think insulin is one of the biggest reasons why pharmaceuticals are so successful because they've taken a relatively simple product with, a, with an absolutely huge ton of R and D and time. They have created products that are way more sophisticated versions of that initial horrible product. Which oftentimes, when you hear about people dying because they couldn't afford insulin, it's because they were buying that cheaper horrible product. There was that one story that went viral a while ago where a guy said that he couldn't afford insulin on his insurance and he went to Walmart and he bought some instead and people were like, oh my God, look at how horrible pharmaceuticals are. No, he had insulin. He just bought the shitty brand at Walmart. You can still buy the really uh, uh, bad. <laughs> you can still buy the we really still, bad. We don't, we don't know. Yeah, right. It's out there. You can right. buy it if you want it, but nobody wants to use it because it's a horrible product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I. Uh, but again, there are libertarians who actually feel that way. So I yeah, I was sure. going to say, there's, there's an entire it. branch of yeah, libertarianism yeah, sure. that agrees yeah. with you on that. Yeah. Um, any other, before we have to wrap up here, any other, um, quickly, any area you want to raise is something else you, you feel that libertarianism is... In a minute, 30, in a minute yes, and 30 yes. seconds. <laughs> a concluding thought about the limits of libertarianism. Um, as, a, as a liberal, 
I like other styles of government or economies because I think they do provide really strong or good critiques. Um, I think that libertarians, ironically enough, are more concerned with certain liberties than liberals are. And I think it's really good to, even if I don't agree with libertarians, to argue with them sometimes and say like, hey, well, maybe the surveillance state, uh, you know, the power is moving a little bit too far. Or maybe, you know, you're defending the idea of a strong US military. Well, how do people in Yemen feel about that? How do people in Iraq feel about that? How do people in Afghanistan feel about that? And I think those are all really valid criticisms and concerns. And like I said, I like liberalism because I can incorporate a lot of those into my current understanding of how our government works and runs, but it's good to have those conversations. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm also glad that we had the conversation. And uh, like I said, I, I think your idea of liberalism sounds uh, suspiciously, at least to the extent that you're talking about it before we get into foreign policy, uh, a lot like classical liberalism, an idea of a, a sort of a overriding overarching idea of respecting certain foundational principles of freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and so forth, and then allowing decisions to be made as, as locally as possible. I'm glad we had this discussion. Uh, I'm not sure how that was 40 minutes went by that fast. Uh, but uh, I will say that I, I think, again, I, my principle in how governance should happen is that you have it as locally, the, the decisions are being made as locally and as much by the actual stakeholders in a given situation as possible. Uh, that the mechanisms by which that government is funded are as voluntary as possible, and that the uh, the ability to opt out uh, is as uh, is allowed as much as possible. And again, I'm just glad that we got to have this conversation. Well, thank you all for tuning in for this one. Um, I'll be hosting another debate with Spike yes. Cohen and uh, my colleague at Reason, Christian Britschke, on anarchy versus minarchy later. And you're yes. doing another debate later? And I'm in three debates today. Yeah. So I will be Again, debating, heroin in the room. Yeah, at 2 o'clock, I'll be debating Warren Just Ray at one of these rooms, uh, or Raya. Uh, and then at 3.30, I will be the uh, token anarchist in the anarchy yeah. versus minarchy debate for, for Reason. So yeah. thank you guys for being here. Thank Destiny, you. Destiny, thank you so much, man. Thank you, everyone.